Welcome you all for the video series on pearls to secure a distinction in medicine loan case. So as you know, medicine loan case is one of the most important components in your clinical examination. And to secure a good grade in medicine, to secure a distinction in medicine, you need to perform very well in your clinical examination. So in this series of video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss common loan cases, common medicine loan cases, and to show the common questions that the examiner would ask from the student and what are the ideal answers the examiners would expect. So here with us we have Dr. Kavishka, one of the recently passed out medical graduates from Peradinia and he's going to do the role playing of a medical student. So he's going to present me a summary of a law case and I will be asking questions in the same way that we ask from the final MBBS exam and at the end of his answer I'm going to give him a feedback. Okay, now can you present the summary of the Hischian examination that you have taken from the patient? My patient is Mr. Sirisena, a 50-year-old manual laborer from Veeratinia who is a diabetic and a hypertensive for the last five years with a poor disease control. He presented with the ischemic type chest pain for two hours duration to the ETU. He's a current smoker with 20 pack years and a heavy ethanol consumer. His father passed away with a sudden cardiac event at the age of 60 years. On examination, he is obese with a BMI of 30. He is not pale. He has xanthalasma and acanthosis nigricans. His pulse rate is 80 per minute. Is regular and all peripheral pulses were present. His blood pressure is 160 by 100 millimeters mercury. He has a stocking type sensor loss in the lower limbs. Okay, good. So in this patient, Mr. Sirisena, what are the problems that you have identified? He has chest pain, diabetes mellitus, hypertension. Also, he is a smoker and a heavy alcohol consumer. He is obese and he has financial problems. Well, making a problem list is something that one should master because having a good problem list at the end of your summary is very important to organize your thoughts as well as to streamline the discussion. And importantly, when you present a problem list as Kavishka did, it should not only be a list of symptoms or list of diseases, but you should put some weight on your problems and you have to pick common areas and make a sensible problem. Say for instance, Mr. Sirisena, what I would expect from an ideal student would be something like this. So Mr. Sirisena has multiple medical problems. So he has acute problems and chronic problems, as well as he has financial and social problems as well. His acute medical problem is he has ischemic type chest pain in the presence of multiple atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factors. In addition, he has many chronic medical problems. He has type 2 diabetes mellitus with poor control on maximum oral hypoglycemic medications with macro and microvascular complications. He has poorly controlled hypertension on three antihypertensive medications with poor control and having many undesirable dietary and lifestyle factors. He is obese and he has features of metabolic syndrome. He is a heavy ethanol consumer with features of dependency and he is a heavy smoker with 30 pack years. And in addition, in Mr. Sirisena, the main financial problem, main social problem he has is he has loss of work with the current acute medical problem and he is the sole breadwinner of a family with four school going children. So your problem list should be something like that where yeah, you give an overall idea and for the examiner it is very easy to take one problem and discuss in detail. Right, so if you are the doctor in the ET when Mr. Sirisena comes with chest pain, how would you manage him initially? You should take a history to see whether it is an ischemic pain and then you should examine the patient and then take an ECG. You should give oxygen and pain relief to the patient Aspirin, clopidogrel and atovastatin should be given to the patient if ECG changes are there. If there is ST elevation myocardial infarction, you, will, you should arrange PCI. 
Right, so this answer is not bad, but there are many aspects that we can improve the answer. Right, so first thing is that when you ask such a question, like how would you manage this patient, the student, what we expect from the student is to tell what he will be doing. So you should not use the word that you should do this thing, you should do that thing. So because the examiners are not the people who are going to manage this patient. So you have to be very confident and tell, okay, I will investigate this patient, I will do this thing, I will do that thing, right? And the next thing is, when you ask about a question about the patient who we have already taken the history and examined, you don't have to go back to the history and examination. You can tell from your history and examination what you have gathered, you have a patient with a two hour history of ischemic type chest pain. So what we expect is for you to present what you would do to this patient. So the ideal answer would be, when Mr. Sirisena comes with target sounding chest pain to the ETO, I will immediately attend to him. I will give him a bed. I will connect him to a multi monitor and arrange an urgent 12 day ECG. And he is in severe pain. So I will relieve his pain by giving intravenous morphine sulfate 7.5 mg as he is 75 kg of bed. And along with that, I will administer 10 mg of IV metacopramide. And then I will give him 300 mg of aspirin to be chewed and swallowed and 300 mg of clopidogrel. And I will start him on atovastatin 80 mg. And then I will look at the ECG and depending on the ECG findings, my rest of the management will differ. And usually here, we examiners would direct you. So examiner might tell you that okay, the ECG shows ST elevations in lead 2, 3 and ABF. Or else sometimes we would give you an ECG and we expect you to go through the ECG and interpret it. So when you are given that task or when you are told about these other changes, always make a diagnosis. Tell Mr. Sirisena has an acute inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. And then he is in Peradeni, which is not a PCI capable centre. So you would talk with Candy, which is the PCI capable centre and it is a place where we can transfer the patient well within two hours and you will tell that you will live with the candy card coach unit and if they are happy to accommodate the patient you will immediately transfer the patient for a primary percutaneous coronary intervention okay right so assume candy cat lab is currently undertaking two primary pci so unfortunately they can't accommodate our patient within the next couple of hours so if that is the case what would you do then i will thrombolize the patient does your patient have any contraindications for thrombolysis? Mm, no, sir. So what are the contraindications for thrombolysis in this patient? Uh, previous intracranial hemorrhage, intracranial neoplasms, recent stroke, uncontrolled hypertension, and any bleeding tendency. Okay, right. Now, what thrombolytic agents are available in Peradeni? Altiplase to place and step to kinase. Okay, and how would you thrombolize this patient? You should give 35 milligrams of tenectoplase bolus. So in this answer, when I ask that when the PCI is not available for this patient, you will go for a thrombolysis. But the student needed a lot of prompting. I had to ask several questions to get the answer. But an ideal student could tell, okay, Mr. Sirisena, is a candidate for primary PCI, but unfortunately we can't transfer the patient within two hours because PCI center is not available at the moment. So in that case, I will consider thrombolizing the patient. Then I will go back to the patient and look for any contraindications for thrombolysis. I will ask about any history of intracranial bleeding, any history of intracranial neoplasm, any stroke of unknown origin, or any recent stroke within last any recent ischemic stroke within last six months etc. So if the patient does not have any contraindication for thrombolysis, I will consider thrombolizing him. So ideally, once the ECG diagnosis is made, the thrombolytic bolus need to be given within 10 minutes. We have streptokinase, we have antipase and we have tinectopase. So if he qualifies for thrombolysis, I will explain him the risks and benefits of thrombolysis and get the consent from the patient and then I will thrombolize. So if I'm thrombolizing him with tinectopase, the dose will depend on his body weight and his age. 
and I will administer 30 milligrams of enoxaparin intravenously just before thrombolysis and then I will administer the thrombolytic bolus which will be followed by 1 mg per kg subcutaneous enoxaparin which will be continued twice a day until the patient has been discharged and during the thrombolytic period I will closely monitor the patient. So as you know we have thrombolyzed the patient. So how would you know that your thrombolysis is successful? So if the thrombolysis is successful, the ST elevations should come down. Okay, that's right. The ST elevation should come down. But the ideal answer should be something like this. Well, the success of thrombolysis will depend on clinical and ECG criteria. So I will talk to my patient, Mr. Sivil Sena, and see whether his chest pain has improved, whether he's feeling better. And at the same time, I will arrange another 20 DCG where I will look for more than 50% reduction in ST elevations. Okay, right. So, Mr. Citizen had an acute coronary event. What risk factors have you identified in his chain examination that can account for his myocardial infarction? Yes, sir. As the risk factors, I identified that he is a diabetic, he has uncontrolled hypertension, he is a current smoker and an alcohol consumer. Yes, the answer is correct. The student has identified the patient has diabetes, hypertension, smoking and he is an ethanol consumer. But an ideal answer would be more organized than this. So one can present, yes, Mr. Sirisena, I have identified modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for his acute coronary event. So his non-modifiable risk factors include his old age, his male sex and having a first degree relative with a sudden cardiac death and in addition he has many modifiable risk factors such as he is a poorly controlled diabetic, poorly controlled hypertensive and he is a current active smoker, he has harmful use of ethanol consumption with features of dependency and he has features of metabolic syndrome. Okay, now assume you receive the patient to your ward after thrombolysis, now he is in the ward HDU. And as a house officer, how would you assess this patient when he comes to the ward? I will check his blood pressure, pulse rate and the lung basis. Also, I will do the basic investigations. I will continue aspirin, clopidogrel and atoll study. Also, I will continue enoxaparin. The answer is correct, but as examiners, we expect a very broad approach to this question. A house officer is expected to cover several areas in the assessment during his ward down of a post-MI patient. So the first thing is he has to assess whether there is clinical improvement after thrombolysis. So he can talk to the patient and see whether the patient has any chest pain, any shortness of breath. And then he can examine the patient looking for any complications after MI. Maybe bradycardia, maybe tachyarrhythmias or hypotension. And then we can repeat the ECG to confirm the resolution of ST elevations. And then secondly, the HO is supposed to assess the complications of the treatment. So he has received a thrombolytic bolus and he is on enoxaparin, he is on aspirin. So looking into facts like whether the patient is bleeding, whether the patient has developed any GORD symptoms or whether the patient has any uh, complications like hypotension, it's important. And then in the history, he has identified that he has many risk factors. The patient has diabetes, the patient has hypertension. So we have to see whether the patient's risk factors are being well controlled during the admission. So if it's, you will check a random blood sugar and if it is very high, you might start insulin for this patient during the acute period. And he's hypertensive, so you need to control the blood pressure. So you might start his routine antihypertensive medications. And here, usually the beta blocker is not a first line antihypertensive, but now you have a compelling indication to use a beta blocker as well because of his angina. So you might optimize or you might change his antihypertensives. And then he's a heavy ethanol consumer who consumes ethanol in a daily basis. So as a house officer, you should be watchful whether he develops any features of alcohol withdrawal. So if that is the case, you might have to treat prophylactically to prevent him going into withdrawal. And then you have to address the aspect of his diet. So he, need, he should not be consuming heavy diet and he should be on a light diet for the first couple of days. And then the mobility. Now immediately after acute MI which was thrombolyzed, he can't be walking to the toilet. So he should be advised to sort of 
have some bed rest in first day and just walk around the bed within next couple of days but not to exert himself to a high degree. Right, so you are the house officer. The same day night, the nurse calls you and tells, uh, Doctor, Mr. Sirisena's blood pressure is low. It is 70 by 50. So you rush to the patient and patient tells you, I'm feeling a bit dizzy but no chest pain. So how would you approach this patient? Sir, I will immediately attend to the patient. I will manage him in SDU. I will assess his airway, breathing and circulation. Then, as he has had the inferior MI, I suspect him to have a right ventricular infarction. Therefore, I will give him a normal saline bonus. Right. So, to start with, whenever you are asked about a medical emergency in the medicine law case, as a blanket transfer, don't tell about the HDU bed because HDU bed is not therapeutic. And the other thing is, I have told you that Mr. Sirisena is telling you that he is feeling a bit dizzy but he doesn't have chest pain. So when he is talking to you, that means that his airway and breathing is alright. Therefore, whenever you are asked about a medical emergency, don't tell that I will attend to his airway, breathing, circulation unless it is medically relevant. And I agree with Kaveshka. A right ventricular infarction is a common complication in inferior MI patients and the treatment is a fluid bolus. But at the final MBBS, at a house officer level, we expect a broader approach than this. So an ideal student would answer, hypotension in the post-MI patient is a medical emergency. So I will immediately attend to the patient and there are many possibilities. So one thing could be right ventricular infarction. Yes, because inferior MI that is common. And in addition to that, it could be due to a reinfarction, could be in the same vascular territory or in a different vascular territory, or it could be due to a tachyarrhythmia or a bradyarrhythmia. And sometimes, after a myocardial infarction, you can have acute valvular incompetencies. And also, now this patient has received tenectopase and he is on inoxaparin, he is on antiplatelets, so he can have a big bleed at any time. So he may be hypotensive because of a torrential GI bleed. And also, as you know, uh, for these patients, we have start a lot of medications to improve the prognosis. We start them on ACE inhibitors, we start them on beta blockers. So this hypotension may be secondary to one of these antihypertensive medications. Or sometimes we start many drugs on a patient and he may be developing an allergic reaction. That may be the reason why the blood pressure is low. And also, he is a vascular path. He's a heavy smoker, he has a lot of atherosclerotic risk factors, so he can have atherosclerotic disease in the big vessels in the arms. So there can be a discrepancy in the blood pressure readings in both arms. So this should be the differential diagnosis. And keeping that differential diagnosis in the mind, you will approach to the patient and you will take a history. So in the history, you will ask whether the patient has any chest pain, any shortness of breath, any bleeding manifestations, any palpitations. And at the same time, you will do a targeted examination where you will look at, check the pulse, you reconfirm the blood pressure and see whether the patient is really hypotensive and you check the blood pressure in both arms and you can go for a radio radial delay as well. And then you will examine the lung basis and look at the JDP because in RV infarction, we expect hypotension with clear lungs and a raised jugular venous pressure. So in this patient, the most likely scenario would be a RV infarction. Therefore, I would expect the patient to have clear lungs, raised JVP and a low blood pressure. So the treatment in that case would be to give fluids to increase the preload. I will start a normal saline bolus and I will monitor the blood pressure and usually in RV infarction, patient might need 1 to 2 liters of fluids to get the blood pressure up. And very rarely, even with aggressive fluid resuscitation, if the blood pressure is not picking up, then I can consider starting him on iron drop. Okay, good. So in this patient, uh, the fasting blood sugar is, you have done a fasting blood sugar which is 180. And you have done HbA1c, it is 10.5%. So what do you think? Uh, and what would you do for this patient? Blood sugar value of 180 is high then the blood sugar control is not satisfactory. Therefore, I will start patient on insulin. Okay, so I agree with that answer. His blood sugar is high, so we need to control it with high glycemics. 
But an ideal student would differentiate these two blood sugar readings. So his fasting blood sugar can be high because it is done immediately after a myocardial infarction. So acute stress reactions can give rise to high blood sugars. But in this particular patient, having an HbA1c of more than 10.5% reflects that his overall glycemic control had been very poor. So in this patient, I would start him on insulin to control the blood sugar in the acute period. But then once the patient is stable and eating and drinking, I will talk to the patient and at the same time I will go through his past medical records to see what medications was, she, was he on and how was the glycemic control. So depending on that, I will decide whether to start him on oral hypoglycemics or to put him on insulin. So if the patient is keen to be started on oral agents, I will start him on metformin as the first line treatment and then I will add second line and third line medications. So as he had an acute coronary event, in ideal setting, second line of drug would be to start him on SGLT2 inhibitor, something like empaglyphosin because it is shown that it controls the blood sugar as well as it improves the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. But unfortunately, empaglyphosin is not freely available in government sector and it is very costly in private sector. So if the patient cannot afford it, I will consider other second line medications such as sulfonylureas. And I will closely monitor his sugars. And if the glycemic control is poor with maximum oral hypoglycemics, I would consider starting him on insulin. Okay, so now we have managed the patient very well and you are planning to discharge Mr. Sirisen. So what medications will he take home? Aspirin, clopidopril, atorvastatin, ACE inhibitor or ARB, and a beta blocker. Well, that answer is correct. So you mentioned that he need to be on aspirin, clopidopril, statin, a beta blocker, and an ACE inhibitor. But an ideal answer would be, I will start the patient on dual antiplatelet treatment, including aspirin and clopidopril. And also, I will start him on a high intensity statin for secondary prophylaxis and then I will start him on maximum tolerable dose of ACE inhibitor and the maximum tolerable dose of beta blocker to improve his prognosis and in addition I will give him sublingual GTN. Okay, now we have given sublingual GTN to this patient. So as a house officer, how would you advise the patient about using sublingual GTN? I will ask the patient to keep a GTN tablet sublingually if he develops any chest pain and I will advise him that he may repeat it up to three times and if the chest pain is not improving, he should come to a hospital. Well, this is a very common question that we ask in the exam. How to advise the patient about GTN? So the ideal answer would be, I mean, you need to introduce what is GTN to the patient. Otherwise, he would not know. So you will sit with the patient and take the GTN tablets and explain it. So the bottle, which is the plastic brown bottle, is the bottle that contains your GTN tablets. So whenever you get a chest pain at home, take one tablet of these and keep it under the tongue. And importantly, when you are taking this tablet, either be seated or lie on the bed. The reason is it can dilate your vessels and your blood pressure can precipitously drop. Therefore, you can have a collapse. So you take first tablet and see whether your chest pain improves. And if it doesn't, you can wait for 5 minutes and you can take the second GTN tablet sublingual. And even with the second tablet, if your pain is not getting away, you need to come to the hospital. So you need to call an ambulance or call a family member to bring you to the hospital. But on your way, you can take the third sublingual tablet. And the other important thing is sometimes you might not need GTN for a month. But just because of that, you can't keep the same plastic bottle for the next month. You need to bring that to the hospital when you come to the clinic and get a refill. Because usually by a month period of time, GTN can get decomposed and expired. And the other important thing is, if the patient is on any tablet, something like sildenafil for erectile dysfunction, and taking GTN at the same time would cause dangerous hypotension. So he should avoid taking GTN if he is taking any uh, medications like Viagra or medically Sildenafil. 
Okay, so that brings to the end of today's medicine law case about acute coronary syndrome. And I will discuss similar common medicine law cases in upcoming videos. So if you are interested in going through these videos, please subscribe the channel. Okay, then I will see you guys in the next video. Good luck.